Uh, yeah, so I, I, I'm really pleased to introduce Michelle Van Gerl uh, from University of Birmingham as our as the last speaker of this conference, who's going to tell us about N. Takahashi's three conjectures. And before I let you start, I want to uh, propose that we give a round of applause to the organizers, Chuck Duran and Ursula Witcher of KAH2 Workshop 3. Let me give a second round of applause to the organizers of the entire program and their resilience in the face of COVID. Uh, Rob, you, uh, Roy Joshua, James Lewis, Chuck Duran, and Mark Levine. Okay. So now, let's get started. Oh, um, there's another uh, cherished tradition for the last um, uh, talk for a workshop, which is to promise that this is going to be light, uh, lighthearted, easy, accessible, and then to make it the most technical talk of the conference. I'm going 30 minutes over time. <laughs> so I, I really hope I'm not going to fall into that category. So I have, oh, oh yeah, maybe I want to start by, um, I named this, this talk um, Nobuyoshi Takashi's Free Conjectures. Um, because he's one of my mathematical heroes. Um, and in fact, as in particular, this one paper, which I forgot to write down, which he wrote in um, 2000, that's where he introduced um, these three conjectures, um, which I will um, explain to you. That paper was published in a really good journal, Communications in Mathematical Physics. And he, I think he introduces some really um, cool, beautiful mathematics. He continued developing this a bit later with two follow-up papers. The first follow-up paper after 20 years has one citation. The second follow-up paper, he tried to submit it twice. Every time people told him it was not interesting. <laughs> so he, he gave up submitting it and he started working on other types of mathematics. Uh, he actually has a publication in the journal of K theory, just, you know, not necessarily relevant here, but, and then he, he worked on quantiles, but, but I think he really introduced some really cool, exciting mathematics. And I'm extremely pleased that, you know, 15 years later, there's just a whole, like, you know, a whole like subfield of enumerative geometry that is working on questions related uh, by Takashi and actually many of, many of of them are here, uh, and so it's 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 really I think it's really exciting that something you know he did twenty years ago that at the time no one thought was interesting is now just living this like uh, amazing renaissance. Um, so, anyways, so these are the people who've been working on his second conjecture. Um, now let me tell you the slogan of my talk. So the slogan of my talk is um, mirror. Theorem uh, within the Grossibert mirror, um, constr mirror construction. Um, mirror construction. Um, I will have uh, three parts. Um, in my first section, I will talk about the three conjectures. In my second section, uh, I will describe the Grossibert mirror. Um, sorry, I'm starting to write badly already. And here, I'm going to use, uh, to great extent, the work of Tim Grefnitz. Um, so so this, this part uses, well, of course, the GS construction, or at least the ideas of the program. It uses a, um, the construction in a particular case I'm going to talk about, 
which is due to Karl Humpela Seabird. Uh, I'm going to abbreviate this by CPS. And it uses most crucially um, the work of Tim Bretnitz. Very cool work. And he's going to talk about this on Monday. So, you know, you can, if you're, if you're around, you can, or if you can uh, log into Zoom, it will be really fun. And, and then my, my third section is, is to deduce the first conjecture. Okay. So, far so good. Uh, I should say this is a uh, joint work with um, Bernd Siebert. Actually, Helge Rudak first. Helge Rudak. And Bernd Siebert. I should also say there's one more result we use, which is by uh, Rudak Siebert. All right, so 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 I haven't told you anything yet. So let's let's get started. So paragraph one, and this is about um, Takahashi's ninety six paper. So he considers the following situation. So we have an elliptic curve in P two. we um, choose as zero element a flex point. We choose a point of order 3D for the positive integer. And then we consider the following curve count. We're looking at maps from P1 into P2, such that the push forward, such that the map is of degree D, where H is the hyperplane class. And that meet the elliptic curve in exactly one point, namely um, PD. I can, I can draw you an image. Um, I think it's time to use some colors. So we choose as our zero element a flex point. Um, then there's a there's a point of order, let's say four here. And then we're counting maps from a P1. Can everyone see, everyone see this color? Or no? Okay, great. Well, not great, but it, it's great because being colorblind, I can see that color. And you know, that's, that's, that's like the rare occasion you don't, you know. Okay, all right. So I think there's some other colors here. So what about this one? This one better? Okay, wonderful. Hmm? Visible? Very good, very good, thank you. So, so and, and, and it's about the lighting. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, anyways, if there's a problem, let me know. <laughs> so, one, two, uh, uh, so for example, we could have a map which is uh, w with image of degree four. So, a map of degree four that meets the elliptic curve in exactly one point. This is a P1. And, and that's a sort of kind of well-defined count um, that, that uh, Takashi studied in, at the end of the 90s. Um, he did this with uh, all of this by hand. He found, of course, the first number is one because this corresponds to you choose a flex point and you look at the number of lines passing through that flex point. Your answer is one. And then he did it for degrees two, three, four, all the way to six. And it's kind of amazing he was able to do that. Um, because if you look at his papers, they're very technical and 
All right. Now, uh, let me introduce a, a moduli space of uh, stable sheaves. So if, if, you, if you're familiar with this story and you think what I'm doing is a bit weird, it's just to be efficient. So let's look at the moduli space of one dimensional stable sheaves. On P2 with Euler characteristic one and which is supported um, on a curve of degree D. Let's, we do, let's define little nd to be the signed all the characteristic of that moduli space. So you can already forget about that moduli space. It's just a really efficient way of introducing these numbers. All right. So we have for every DM moduli space, uh, we take their all the characteristic, we put a sign there. So Takashi's first conjecture. Um, is that this really strange kind of moduli space knows about, I mean, it depends. Either you find one side or the other side strange, or maybe you find both sides strange, but this kind of, this moduli space somehow knows about these counts. Yeah, so the conjecture is that little nd, oops, is equal to minus one, d minus one, three d, times MD, right? This was proven very recently. So this is proven, proven by a combination of Tim Grefnitz. Let's put Grefnitz by Tim and Busso. And it's really a lot of work. It's, I think it's, if you put the papers together, it's more than 200 pages. And it's really a lot of work. It involves spaces with bridge and stability conditions. It involves complicated degenerations, et cetera. But it's been proven. So if you want to, yeah, anyways. So this was, uh, Bousseau was in 19. And I mean, I'm, that was also around 19. I don't, I'm not exactly sure, around 19. All right. Um, let me go over here. So, so the, the, the invariant I introduced, MD is a little bit inconvenient because it's really hard to compute, but also it kind of has this dependency on a point. So is there some invariant which is independent of the point? And Jan says, yes, yes, there is, yes. So we look at a different moduli space. I, I kind of want to get over the, um, to this quickly because this is not the main topic of my talk. So this is a, this is due to Abramovich, Shen. Rules and CBET. There's a moduli space of stable long maps, which are morphism from a stable map C to P2. A stable map is a, is a union of, um, is a tree of P1s in this case. We're only in genus zero. Um, again, the push forward should be of degree D. And we have this condition that 
we want to meet E in one point of tangency 3D, where, where, where this is not, not specified. Now, if you want to know more about this moduli space, we conveniently have a speaker next week, Dhruv Ran Ganatan on Tuesday, who will talk about that. Um, I just maybe want to give you a little bit of a flavor of what's going on, because because now this moduli space has several components of different dimensions, and we kind of want to extract some numbers out of it. So I just want to give you a little idea of how this works by drawing a few pictures. For example, so m log four, in degree four, we have different components corresponding to different uh, settings. So th that's that's kind of the generic setting. So where we have E and we have a curve of degree four that meets E in exactly one point. This, um, I mean, this component is zero dimensional, or in other words, you have a bunch of points. It, it, can, it does get complicated because for, for some choices of E, there might, uh, this might become not a nodal curve, but it may develop some some strange singularities so it's not as straightforward but basically this is zero dimensional we could also have other components such as multiple covers so um if i choose a flex line i could have a map um four to one from p1 to this flex line that covers it so this is a positive dimensional i mean these give rise to positive dimensional components um but now it actually gets worse because uh, well let me draw another one here where we could have a degree two a conic and we could have a um a two to one map from p1 to the conic and then we, we, we also have some really bad components where um, the image decomposes into. Uh, not that. The image decomposes into two components, such as a nodal cubic and a line and a flex line. And so it really gets messy. And, and there's like some magic, which is called virtual intersection theory. That extracts some invariance out of this. So virtual magic. Leads to an invariant. So virtual magic tells you how out of each of those components, how to extract a cycle of degree zero, a zero cycle. I think I just, I just explained why I'm giving a talk on a workshop on algebraic cycles. <laughs> so this is a zero cycle. Therefore, you can take its degree and you get a rational number because it's a Delin Mumford stack because it's a Delin Mumford stack. And then, so Takahashi's second conjecture um, states that, um, also Takahashi, that this number is also computed by these little NDs here in the following way so 
there's always these signs that that we carry with us. We, we never try to understand them because <laughs> I'm not sure we can. <laughs> they just they, they just come along for the ride. Um, okay, cubed and d divided by k. So so we have a decomposition of all um, of all the devices of d one over k cubed little n d over k. And and if you maybe this, this is this is what is this is called the local Fomovitan invariant, or maybe I should have said that this is a this is a log Fomovitan invariant, and so this is the first example. This conjecture is the first example of a log local correspondence. Um, I have the space here. So first of all, it was proven um, by Gartman pretty pretty shortly shortly afterwards. This was proven. Gartman, um, and and this then led to the possibly in higher genus first local log. And then adjectives have been have 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 kept being added to it, such as open, orbifold, punctured, um, quiver, and then I, I don't know what else will come correspondences. And so, to me, it is yes. Local P two and right. Yeah. 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 That's correct. Absolutely. And then the extension to like log open or local log or whichever order you, you like it is you you change this divisor by any nth divisor of your choosing and then it becomes all minus that nth divisor and you could do this in all dimensions for you know and then and then there's like various there's like generalizations to like simple normal crossings divisor then there's like to open chromovit invariance of a different geometry to all before chromovit invariance of an associated root stack some experts of that in the audience then i think people are pushing it to punctured invariance locally here at cambridge <laughs> I think uh, maybe you is doing that, and then and then there's like quivers. As well. It just it just keeps, you know. One way of answering like why is this is that it there seems to be that the space of solutions is much smaller than the space of questions. <laughs> you have a yeah. Oh, so Gatman only did um, these two, yeah. But then but then the story like basically all the names I wrote on the, on here, the, the, all the names that I, that I wrote were kind of involved in some generalization of that. Yeah. Yes? Oh. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think no one no one no one thought about that. We should we should introduce that from now on. L L L L, -Q L loop. L loop. Wow, that's so cool. Yeah. L loop Q. I love it. C, I oh, wait, wait, okay, L, L, O, O, C, U, uh -huh, uh -huh. It's correspondence, Q, C, no, sorry, sorry, it's getting too complicated, I take the Q, 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 yeah, and the C, okay, anyways, yeah, it, It shall henceforth be named by this. <laughs> All right, so um, so what, what is the third conjecture of Takahashi? So this is what I will be talking about um, next. I, I, and, and, and this is, I should say, I, I, see, I, I saw this, I read this paper when I was a PhD student 
it's just six papers as six pages and and i don't know i think it took me how did he how did he formulate these conjectures he computed stuff i mean it's just unbelievable how you to me how he could have like came up come up with these conjectures based on computation only and 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 so i've always been a bit obsessed about trying to understand this so let's let's get to it so what's the third conjecture so conjecture three that's this like mirror symmetry symmetry conjecture so there is a mirror family so, so we've seen talks about mirror symmetry so this is just a battery wave voice of mirror symmetry so we have a mirror family which is given by the zero locus of x y minus phi x cubes plus y cubed plus one inside c star squared so, so it's a bit different than i know classical battery of force of mirror symmetry this in fact gives us um this gives us a so, so if you take the pencil determined here you get a elliptic vibration um, or an affine elliptic vibration So this is, you know, maybe, maybe I'll put it here. Is that something I can keep? Uh, I'll put it over there. So we have an affine, this determines an affine elliptic vibration. So it's, it's elliptic curves minus three points. So punctured elliptic curves. One, actually let's use this one. One, two, three. Um, map to the plane. Uh, it has three singular fibers, which become these punctured, uh, the, the, these punctured elliptic, uh, I don't know if they're called punctured elliptic curves. <laughs> so we have three fibers, three singular fibers, well, let me just, yeah, well, let me draw all of them. Yeah. And so this is our, this is our E phi. Check. And if you, this is the type of left shots, left shots vibration. And the sort of thing people consider is in the neighborhood of these punctures, you have some, um, you're looking at vanishing cycles. If you put them together, you get left shed spindles. So you can imagine that as you move away, this, this little point here um, gets, I don't know, becomes a circle. And then as you trace this out, you get these left shed spindles. So you can see that this, we have this circle that as we go closer here, just vanishes to a point. Um, so here we get these left sheds of thimbles, gamma phi i. That you can read this, this is okay? Yeah, very good. Maybe, maybe I'll, I'll put it in yellow so that it's really clear. So gamma phi i, these left sheds of thimbles. This is a left sheds of thimbles. And as you know, they, they, they give a basis. There are three of them, which gives a basis of left shed symbol of, of the relative homology group. C star square relative to uh, this fiber. Okay. And now, so what's the conjecture?
So. So what Takashi does is he studies, he studies integrals as follows. So I, I phi to be and so so so-called period integrals dx x wedge dyy um so so we can think of this as maps from space of phi to um c this is a kind of so we have a we're looking at the logo that like the um holomorphic volume form on c star squared you want logarithmic two form we integrated against these lachette symbols we're just doing i don't know complex analysis and then and then well we observe that they or takashi observes that these satisfy some sort of um pika fuchs equation uh while we cannot compute this directly the pika fuchs equation we can uh solve and then we get three solutions so, so solutions from abstract principles, you know, from so what I mean is that he 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 shows that they satisfy a system of Pika Fuchs equation. Pika solutions to Pika Fuchs equations are known, so you can just write it out. And he obtains that. The first one is, I mean, is a constant. So, so this is a basis, basis of solutions, I should say, basis of solution. The first one is a constant. The second one has the following shape. Um, so, so, so there's like a change of coordinate that you should do, which is you should take phi to the power of three. Um, but let's ignore that. Log phi cubed plus some holomorphic part and then i2 phi cube is one half log square phi cubed plus log phi cubed times holomorphic part plus holomorphic part so if you study this sort of thing, and, and I'm certainly not an expert, then you, you can, the, the, the way you think about these is we have three types of solutions that either they have like log to the power zero or their monodromy around the origin is log, log to the phi cube or their monodromy around the origin is log square or something. Yeah. So, that's, so, so that's not a conjecture yet. So what's a conjecture? So first, um, and maybe I can put it here. So 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 in in, in this in this type of story, um, people declare, and it's not clear to me why, but people declare that I one gives a transcendental. Coordinate, coordinate change uh, this is also called the mirror map which effectively means we're going to replace phi by some other coordinate q very mysterious thing and then the conjecture is that well i3 i3 if we express i3 in q so we take this function and you we write it with the new coordinate given by q and this equals log square minus q divided by two plus and here the magic occurs plus the homomorphic part which has a taylor series expansion in terms of the nds So we plug in this miraculous mirror map. 
and then that thing just kind of gives us these invariants. Now, now if you ask someone, what, why is that? Yes. Uh, square, sorry. Dark square, thank you. So, so there was, uh, yeah, so there was a square here that this was log squared, but uh, I put phi cubed. But the phi, we, we don't care about, like, but here I change it into Q. So, so, so it's, a, it's, a, it's the same first term because here we have, uh, actually that, that holomorphic bit comes from here. So, oh, um, so if you kind of, anyways, there's a transformation to do. And then this is what you get. And, and I certainly don't want to get into details. <laughs> In fact, this is very mysterious to me. Uh, are there more questions? So, 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 so the upshot of this is that for some reason, these integrals are supposed to know something about uh, these invariants up there. And again, if you, are, if you ask someone, why is that? They will tell you, well, we have a variation of mixed heart structure on one side. From there, we extract something which is called, I don't know, there's, some, there's a Yukawa coupling. And then we have a variation of heart structure on the other side. There's a Yukawa coupling, or maybe Gauss-Manin, whatever, <laughs> something coupling. And, and these two are predicted to be equal by mirror symmetry. And if you kind of look at the, the information that determines both sides, you get the um, equivalence. And, and, and that's that, yeah. So my, 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 my question has always been, um, well, can you give a more satisfactory answer to that? I, I, it, it, of course, it depends on who you ask, but I, I am, I'm very, uh, yeah, but, but, but to me, that was not, never very satisfactory. Sorry, <laughs> with my sincere apologies. <laughs> because, because, I guess because if we understand mirror symmetry, do we understand mirror symmetry now? I, I, I certainly don't. Um, with apologies to the everyone I offended right now. Um, so, so question. Can we describe I, I, let me put, can we extract, let, let me put this way. Can we, can we somehow extract this from the mirror construction? Can we extract this? What I mean by this is that if we carefully build our mirror, is it possible that these things just fall out of the construction? And by mirror construction, I mean gross mirror construction. And the answer is, uh, can we extract this thing and the period integral, I guess, well, all of them, uh, how do I call them? From the mirror construction. Can they kind of like fall out so that mirror symmetry becomes, I, I don't want to say triviality, but <laughs> at least something we can kind of, um, uh, you know, follow. And the answer and the upshot of my talk is yes, we can. So in order to explain to you how it works, um, so, so, so again, the upshot of my talk is you apply the gross mirror construction and then that thing becomes that thing. 
Okay, so well, but first I need to describe the mirror construction. So this is due to CPS, Carl Pumpala Siebert, and then I will need uh, Tim's result, which is the A model correspondence. Of, of well, G for graphene. So, so here P2E is mirror to uh, a family. You always have families on the B side with a fiber. I mean, that's not, that, that was known before. This is an elliptic vibration. Um, it's given by the superpotential. Uh, we're gonna. So we have um, And what's really important here is that T is the Grossibert parameter. And that's really important because remember, I told you that we use I1 to get this mysterious coordinate change. And somehow the whole spiel, I don't, I don't, not the whole spiel, but something really nice about the Grossiba program is that this coordinate chain is intrinsic in the construction. So we don't have to, we don't have to do this coordinate change. And that's why it's really important that we use this Grossiba parameter T. So I, I know I, I upset people who work on mixed hot structure. So I want to redeem myself now by explaining how this fits beautifully and with, with, with like these, these dualities between uh, variations of mixed hot structures. In fact, um, the kind of like kind of the, the next thing to do is to lift what I'm talking about to the variations of mixed hot structure. So, so here we have a heuristics. which is the following. So we have, I, I think I don't need this one. So we have this P2 comma E, and we have a tropicalization functor, or trop well, tropicalization morphism, tropicalization, to the GS space. So this is something maybe Tim will explain to you next week. Um, but we don't really care exactly what it is. Should I practice that? So this is a cylinder. This is a cylinder that I've been drawing in a strange way. And maybe Tim will explain to you on, on Monday how we get that cylinder. I, I will definitely not do it now. Um, there's a, the cylinder has like a asymptotic triangle, um, E. E is mirror to this E. Um, that's in uh, Karl Pumpala Siebert. And on the other side, we have this mirror family X, T, E, T, check. That's also from Karl Pumpola Siebert. This is a heuristics, I'm not being precise. We also have, heuristically, we have a 
moment map here. I'm just going to call it M, M. So you should think about this thing is glued together from pieces which occur here. And, and the morphism from this, these, these charts to the pieces is very much like the moment map. Oh, of course, there's also a bit of a deformation, but I'm not talking about, I'm not, don't want to go into too much detail. Yeah, so here we go. Check P. All right. So now Tim's result tells us that, I'll just do it in one example, that these and these here, oh, you don't see this one, right? No, you do see this. So ND log will correspond on the tropicalization to some tropical curves here. And I'll just show you one of them, which is this one. So this is a flex line up here will correspond to this sort of uh, tropical gadget here. And again, maybe come to Tim's talk on Monday. To understand that better. Now let's let's push this heuristic a little bit further. Let's just let's just be crazy, right? Because sometimes you want to dream big and try crazy things. Right? So, so here I, I took a curve and mapped it, uh, uh, sorry, a, like max, one of these like maximal tangent curves and I mapped it to something at the bottom. But I, I could also have started with some, I don't know, the, the, from, with some um, I-dimensional variety with a class in H, a, a cycle in H I I P to relative E. I'm not really worrying about how to define this, but let's just let's just pretend we, we know how to do this, VI. And then I could have mapped it to something down here, which is its tropicalization, and maybe its class under the tropicalization as an element of like tropical I cycle. Yeah. Well, if I and then I can go on the other side by taking a Lagrangian Li, which is fibered over, um, well, its image under the moment map. And so this would be a Lagrangian. I really need to write a bit better. This is a Lagrangian. I'll explain how this works in a second. And this would give me an element in H I two minus I X T E T check. And here for the people who know about, well, if you think about mirror symmetry as a duality of Hodge diamonds, that's exactly the duality between, um, duality between the central um, central, the vertical axis here and the horizontal axis or the, or on this side of Hodge diamond. Yeah, Hodge diamond. So why am I telling you about this? Well, now we could expect that, well, this, you know, this thing is like each of them is one dimensional for H zero zero H00, H11, H22. Well, we could you know, look at their tropical cycles, look at a corresponding Lagrangian and integrate over that. And maybe this is gonna give us back these periods. Yeah. And it, that's exactly what happened. So let me, let me make that a little bit precise. 
Um, so here, so something happened, which is that we compactify the fibers, but everything else stays the same. So I, I might as well leave it. Uh, this one will, will be useful to have for later. But let's try to do exactly what I started to describe, which is let's start with a, with a zero cycle in H00. Let's see what occurs on the, let's see what Lagrangian it corresponds to on the other side. Let's integrate over this and see what happens. So, Well, so a point on the tropicalization, tropicalization respects uh, dimensions, it would be sent to a point. So it would be sent to um, a point here. And now we're going to lift this to a Lagrangian, to a middle dimensional gadget in here. This is two dimensional, so we need something complex, one dimensional. So, well, if you think about this being a polytope and the moment map being the moment map from toy geometry, then you'll know that this is keeping track of um, keeping track of, of this. And then um, the fiber will be uh, S1 times S1, the two torus. And yeah. yeah. Exactly. Exactly. We're just taking one element of the Lagrangian vibration. Absolutely. And then if we integrate dx over x, wedge dy over y, 1 over 2 pi i squared. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm really bad at integrals. And so it took me some time to figure that out. <laughs> Not that hard. We have, you know, this reduces to like a residue formula. <laughs> This has residue one, this has residue one, you know, Fubini separates you the, into the two, and we get that this thing is equal to one. Now, I mean, for some people, this comes easy, not to me. Does that one remind you of the one we had earlier? Uh, I zero phi equals one, phi, right? It, it does kind of remind you of that, yeah. One. That one looks very much like that one over there. And if you think about earlier, I introduced these period integrals coming from left shed thimbles. Well, now I have a left shed thimble. I integrate over it and I get the expected answer up to a constant. Because that was just a basis thing. All right. So we, we checked the trivial case. Now let's, let's, let's try the next case, which is, well, we started with a point. What if we start with the curve? What if, in, so we, we, we took an element in H00, zero zero, now let's take an element in H11. One one. So, um, in fact, let's take a generator because we're, we're interested in, in, in finding bases. Well, tropicalization maps this to the cycle we've already seen, right? Um, this cycle here, color. Uh, I, I wrote it in red. Well, now let's take the um, corresponding Lagrangian that sits over it. Well, a tropical cycle. So this is this is um, what I'm describing here is is consequence of Rudat Siebert. So they explain what is a tropical one cycle, and the tropical one cycle is something. You, is it something like this? You can move it around. Uh, it's it, as a, you know as a good cycle. It's not like fixed, but it comes with some 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 like direction, and then that direction determines a orthogonal S1 upstairs. 
and and if you just you know go through the definition you find that this corresponds to Lagrangian which looks something like this right I mean really what you expect so we just have an this is an s1 fiber Lagrangian over this gadget here yeah and, and you know it's, yeah and and in their paper uh, which came out I guess maybe two years ago or something they compute um, so their theorem so this is rs theorem rs you know I, I, what what on yeah I should I, I'll just put it here sorry for that so theorem rs um, so t is canonical this means that the exponential of now we do one over two pi i because we have one s1 uh, we have the, the, the fiber is one copy of s1 it's a one torus integral over over that thing um you know uh, let's call this over that thing of dx over x wedge dy over y and I find that this is minus t cubed, which is a canonical coordinate. So they, are there questions? Okay. So now let me come to the main result, which is that, um, so, so, so let me, what we've been doing here is we, we kind of lived in a dreamland for a second where we have some cycles in HII, we look at their tropicalizations. We look at Lagrangians that are fibered over it. We integrate them against the canonical volume form, holomorphic, kind of holomorphic volume form. And then we kind of found, first we found that the first one gives you one as we expected. And the second one gives us just Q. Um, I mean, here I took exponential, right? So it's like log Q. And, and that's actually as expected because I told you that in the, uncorrected mirror family you have to do this mirror map you have to do this change of coordinates but here we're already in canonical coordinates and therefore there's no such thing that occurs all right so what's our main result uh, i guess i can put it here so our main result is to do this for the last cycle and you'll actually why don't i show you what the last cycle is up here so so um So I, I don't know, think about it for 30 seconds. What's what's the only two-dimensional tropical cycle we, we might have in this two-dimensional torus? <laughs> it's it's just the whole the whole torus, right? So so if we just take everything, that is a that corresponds to that corresponds to uh, the full the whole of P2, right? If we just think about P2, the cl class of P2 as an element in H22, this is, this tropicalizes to the, that, you know, that, that's the idea of the GS base, the received base is that it is the tropicalization of the thing. And then this, under the moment map, this should, this should correspond to some cycle here, which is, which lives inside X of T has boundary in E of T. So, so we want to cut off at E in order to make sure that its boundary is really here. Well, can we, do we have the cycle? Yes. Um, we just do kind of a real version of the Grossiebel program. So this is determined, uh, determined by Grossiebel over the reals. So you think about this gadget here um, with, with, with something called scattering um, determines a mirror family. The mirror family is locally determined. We have some, we have some walls that carry some wall crossing functions and the wall crossing functions determine the mirror by some equations which are locally given by Z plus Z minus equal to Fi, maybe times T to some power. Now that whole construction we can um, just do it over the reals, you know, and that gives us a 
kind of real real two cycles, Lagrangian two cycle, that sits inside the family very happily, very beautifully. Here we need to use um, Tim's result, which states that the product, the log of the product of these FIs is the sum of 3D um, ND uh, WT to the, okay, now I'm getting this, I think there's a 3D here. Uh, and then maybe now it's correct. Yeah. And then if we just put everything together and integrate over that cycle, I, then we get the following and that will be the end of my talk almost in on time. Oops. Just take a good look at what you see here. That came out of nowhere, right? That was kind of, you know, like declared out of nowhere. So what we get is the following. The theorem. We, we need to take a derivative, but that's not really very important. So the integral over this cycle over there of dx x wedge dy over y. Miraculously, I always find it miraculous. You you look at some conjecture, you have no clue. They kind of got it by some like numerology, and then you know you work on it for really really long time, and then somehow, somehow once you have the kind of right framework, then it just like drops out by a simple calculation. And now if you take this equation and you take the derivative in Q and you multiply by Q, that's exactly what you get. And Somehow that's what their computation tells us. So I hope I, I could explain to you how um, using the right um, kind of way of thinking about mirror symmetry, which is the Grosseva program, if you're look, looking at the right mirror construction, then the sort of predictions that come from physics, from you know, uh, variations of mixed heart structures, from just pure computations, they just drop out of the construction. I think someone's telling me to stop. So <laughs> I think that would be the end of my talk. Comes back on. It's because I, I declared I stopped it, you know, it came back on. Do we have questions either from the Zoom participants or the audience? I think I, I have a comment. I think, I mean, this is great. It's very direct. It presumably generalizes to non-toric cases, to non-toric fanos, ultimately. I hope the way that Spencer and Pierre and I wrote our result in our paper didn't give the impression that we hadn't proved anything. We were just gonna, I mean, we, we prove that result, but with the local term of Whitman invariance. And, right. Uh, for all toric fanos, um, we do it for surfaces, but I mean, the method generalizes. But I think this has potential to generalize to non toric fanos, I assume. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. My apologies. I, I didn't, I phrased, I phrased this in a way that I, that was maybe a, yeah. not. But I mean, because we part. start, I mean, ours yeah. is much less direct because we start with Iratani's result, which yep. is, you know, is integral symmetry right. for. Pure variations, and when we de degenerate on both sides. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So, 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 yeah. I think I phrased this incorrectly. What, what I mean to say is that that can be proven using like uh, your paper. That's that's not um, somehow the the novelty here is that we we get it from this Gaussian mirror construction. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah. Like, and, and that's fantastic. Yeah, and 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 in some sense, yeah, the result in itself is not particularly interesting. And as you say, uh, it it. And, and, and I completely agree with this. But yeah, the, 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 the upshot here is that we can extract this from the Grossi-Bermuda construction, which, which is not, you know, doesn't 
basically that, that, that method goes through in non-toric cases. It doesn't really use any, I mean, it, yeah. we use uh, Tim's result, mm -hmm. which is proven for non-toric cases. So, so there's no problem for uh, so. looking at non-toric cases and, and also um, it, it might very well also generalize to higher dimensions and stuff. So. That's beautiful. It feeds right into what I want to do next with Chuck and Al. Wonderful. Anyone else have questions, comments, anything? No one on Zoom? Let's thank Anna Shell for a beautiful talk and enjoy your time. Uh, this was a great week. Thanks, everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, it was really fun. <laughs>